Welcome to the 2014 REAP Application and Project Example Webinar. My name is Ron Ullman, State Energy Coordinator for USDA Agriculture, Rural Development, Minnesota, and I'm joined by Fritz Ebinger of the Minnesota Project. Before we begin, I want to give a big thank you to Minnesota Project, the University of Minnesota Clean Energy Resource Teams, and the Great Plains Institute for partnering with, with us on this webinar. It is a very busy time of year for these organizations, and we thank them for working with us on getting this discussion out to all interested parties. As you may have heard, the REAP program was reauthorized in the 2014 Farm Bill. The program is now over 10 years old with the first authorization in the 2003 Farm Bill. REAP in Minnesota has established one of the strongest programs in the country in terms of dollars and projects awarded. And partners that we are here with today help foster this appetite for renewable energy and energy efficiency projects and connect people to our organization. We felt that this was a great platform to inform potential applicants, interested parties, and other partners, also known as our REAP peeps, of the program highlights. In the next hour, I'll be discussing the 2014 funding cycle, run through the application template, and overview our scoring criteria. Then I will turn it over to Fritz, who will be providing us with some examples of energy efficiency and renewable energy projects around the state. There will also be a question and answer session at the end of the presentation if we haven't covered everything you wanted to know. We have reviewed the registration list and noticed many people on the call are not from Minnesota. So I wanted to mention, although we'll be focusing on the Minnesota application template and project examples, this is a federal program, so the, the program exists nationwide. There is an equivalent of me in your state, and most of what I'll be covering pertains to all applicants, regardless of your project's geographic location. First, I'd like to talk about some general program parameters that exist for REAP, application eligibility and project eligibility. There are two groups of eligible uh, recipients for REAP funding, the small, uh, rural small businesses and agriculture producers. I wanted to take a moment and dissect how REAP defines these entities. A business is a private entity, which can be a sole proprietor, corporation, partnership, electric utility, or cooperative, uh, which does include electrical cooperatives, uh, schools, nonprofits, and municipal or government groups are not eligible for REAP funds. Uh, to be small, the business must meet the definition in the Small Business Administration size standards. These standards can be found on the SBA website and are organized by the North American Industry Classification System code or NAICS code. Uh, I have found using the keyword search of, of the main purpose of the business will lead to your correct classification and you'll be able to figure out what your size standard would be. To be rural is defined as being outside a metropolitan area of 50,000 or greater in its adjacent urbanized area. These areas include the Twin Cities metro area, St. Cloud, Duluth, Rochester, Moorhead, and East Grand Forks. So most of the state geographically is classified as rural, but we recommend checking out the link on our website if you are close to one of these areas. It is located under the eligibility link. Our second group of applicants are ag producers. These applicants do not need to be located in a rural area, so they can be actually anywhere in the state, but have to have 50% of their income be from their agriculture operations. This would eliminate hobby farms or other operations where a majority of the income is from non-farm income generating activities. This is determined by the latest year's tax returns and uses gross income and sales, not your net income. Uh, however, uh, operations that do not qualify as an ag producer because you don't meet the 50% requirement may still qualify as rural small businesses, um, depending if their structure is established that way. Uh, there, is, there is no minimum size of a business required. Uh, REAP can, can provide financing for both renewable energy and energy efficiency systems. Under renewable energy, eligible technologies include anaerobic digesters, solar installations, installations, uh, both the thermal and PV style, wind turbines, wood-fed or biomass boilers, and geothermal systems. The power generated can be used to replace energy used by the operation or, be, or generated to be sold. On the energy efficiency side, projects may include energy-saving lighting, pumps, refrigeration upgrades, and grain dryers. Any project really which saves energy is an eligible energy efficiency project. Uh, however, switching energy sources is not, an el is not eligible as a standalone project, but it can be incorporated in into an energy efficiency 
uh, improvement. For example, a farmer would like a new grain dryer, but also hook up to a natural gas line that recently crossed in front of his property. As part of the project, we can include the cost to install the natural gas line uh, as, as well as uh, in the grain dryer improvement. Uh, this does tend to drive up the project costs, which can affect the point system, the points, the points the, the project would receive and available funding. Uh, the recent Farm Bill passage also included a provision that makes flux fuel pumps ineligible for the program. These are known as blender pumps and allow a customer to choose the percentage of ethanol to be used in their vehicle. So again, these are no longer an eligible uh, provision or uh, an eligible project with the REIT program. The REIT program is commonly associated with its grant program. Given its 25% cost share of the total project cost, we can understand why. There are very few programs providing grant assistance on such a wide variety of technologies. Uh, the initial anticipated funding level of the program for 2014 is $12 million in grant funds. The entire amount will be given to the states to allocate. It is not known what the allocation for Minnesota will be uh, quite yet. For those of you familiar with the program, uh, you understand that $12 million is not very much money when spread over 50 states. However, uh, in the recent Farm Bill passage, $50 million was allocated annually for uh, REAP funds. Uh, however, it is not known at this time when those funds will be available. Um, if the 2014 application cycle will be used to provide the list of projects, we want to make sure that all of our projects are on that list. So we, we are still encouraging people to submit their applications for 2014. Uh, additionally, REAP will also have $57 million in uh, guaranteed loans, and this program can provide lenders with a guaranteed on their loans ranging from 65 to 80% of the total cost. The rates and terms for these loans are determined by the lender, and the level of guarantee varies depending on the cost of the project. Historically, not all of these funds have been used, so any interested applicants or lenders with a complete application will likely get funded this year. Additionally, applications for combination guaranteed loans and grants will be accepted. Uh, these projects use the same pool of funds as the separate loan grant program. The newly passed Farm Bill also rescinded the feasibility study grant portion of the REIT program, so these funds will no longer be available. And, and although this program is still available, uh, the timing with the 2014 funding cycle will not, uh, will not allow the Renewable Energy Development Assistance or Energy Audit Grant program to be funded. Uh, the deadline for submittal of all grant and combination applications will be 60 days from the publication of the NOFA. Uh, the NOFA, uh, the publication of the NOFA is it anticipated to be later in March or possibly early April. Uh, this still means you should be starting now, especially if you need to register your business with the appropriate organizations uh, or if you need an energy audit or energy site assessment depending on your project. All application materials need to be submitted by that date, including technical reports and any scoring documentation. So if it's 50 degrees a day in Minnesota, uh, and apparently predictions about the end of the winter seem true, meaning there's times are going to be busy soon for most people, especially um, agriculture producers or farmers working to get in the fields. So we recommend starting on the application now. The last thing you want to be doing in the middle of May is figuring out the application process. Applications, once they're done, can be submitted to the Minnesota State Office um, Pay by, uh, by mail. There's no need to include divider pages or tabs since we will scan the application and this really just slows down our process. Uh, you also can submit uh, the application electronically through grants.gov. Again, if you go to grants.gov, once the uh, NOFA is published, you will be able to find the application uh, potential submission uh, protocol there. The final guaranteed application date we do know is going to be July 31st of this year. However, biweekly award cycles will be occurring on the guaranteed loans only applications once the NOFA is announced. So complete guaranteed loan applications will be funded much sooner than grants. Uh, also note two important points about these deadlines. 
is one is that we do accept applications all year long. So if you miss the upcoming deadline, you can submit your application for consideration in the 2015 cycle. And the second point is that only post-application expenses can be funded, so we cannot reimburse for projects or components that have already been completed at the time of application. So please note that before your submittal. Um, further information uh, on our program is developed at our REAP specific page. I Google USDA Minnesota REAP uh, to avoid memorizing any WEAP, uh, web addresses. And that is usually the first thing that pops up. So again, USDA, MN, REAP, and you will get to where you need to be. Um, so the website includes links to project eligibility, um, application templates, and past project information. So quite a bit of information on there uh, to look at. So right now I'm going to go through and talk about the live demo that we have of our new application. So I'm pulling up a, uh, a new template for the simplified grant application. There's a couple highlights I wanted to just go through. Um, this is a large file, so just give it some time to, to work itself to get up. Um, and once it's on there, you'll see some uh, documents or folders to the left hand side and then the cover or title page on the on the right hand side. Um, this is organized by divider tabs. Each tab is how we want to see the application be submitted and everything uh, that's supposed to be there should be noted in that uh, tab. And once the overall document is downloaded, there is no need to download each document. So you just need to download this one file. And once you alter it and save it, you will then save your changes. And all these forms are fillable. So you'll be able to edit right into the, this document. So I'm just going to run through the, some of the tabs real quick for you. There's, I said, the title sheet. Um, there's a cover page as well as the table of contents. Those are not part of any sort of uh, specific tab or just guides for you to get started. Uh, tab A includes um, some of the federal tax ID, DUNS numbers, and the cage codes. So again, those aren't specific pages, but we do need those numbers and are considered a complete application. It will not be considered a complete application until they're submitted. Um, one other point is that you can also go back uh, using the home tab and that'll get you to the back uh, to the main page uh, tab B is just our certifications we really these are just signature forms for you uh, to fill out not a whole lot of work there so I won't go into that too much uh, tab C is our legal documents Again, there's not much to this tab uh, but you just want to, if you're a small business, need to show proof of how your business is incorporated. Tab D is quite a bit of um, where quite a bit of work will be done. There's a project summary tab. You're going to include information about your eligibility as an entity and also an eligibility as a project. Uh, well, as well included in there will be our IRS forms to approve your size and um, how your business is structured, uh, as well as in this tab, you'll see information for the documentation of commercially available project. And that's going to be some vendor information, uh, something that allows us to show that, the, that this is a, an operating uh, technology. Again, and the last one I just wanted to note was the evidence of site control. And that is just usually a form that's the property tax uh, statement for the, for the year a copy of that is submitted shows sufficient ev uh, evidence of site control. If you don't have that or if it's on a different site and you're still going to be the owner of the project, you will, will need to see some sort of evidence of uh, that there's a long-term lease or some sort of uh, access to that site. Okay, Going back to uh, tab E is matching funds. This tab allows you to uh, submit uh, funds that will be used for the other 75 percent of the project and this is uh, going to be done through a bank statement or um, a letter from the bank official 
indicating that the remaining amount of funds are available for your project. So tab F is the self-evaluation score, score sheet. And again, this is the same score sheet that we use when we're evaluating the project. So um, you're going to give yourself a score and we'll review that and see if it's correct. But also it allows you to submit the documentation, the required documentation, to prove that you would be eligible for those points. Uh, tab G is where you would put your energy audit if you had an energy efficiency project. Um, you put that in under tab G or your energy audit or energy assessment, depending on the size of your project. And then tab H is the last tab under the simplified application. And under the, there's a subfolder under here where you have a number of different uh, Word documents that are templates for your narrative for your technical report. So I'll get into the technical report here in a little bit. I'm going to go through and discuss the scoring criteria. And so the scoring system is a 10 criteria decision-making tool uh, used to rank the projects for funding purposes. Uh, there's a 30, 130 point max and we're just going to quickly run through the different criteria and hit some important notes uh, to ensure that all the documentation is submitted that you need to submit. Energy efficiency projects uh, as number one, energy efficiency projects get points for the percentage of energy saved of what is currently being used. So this information is left directly from the audit or energy assessment. Um, you do get an additional five points if you get an audit and your project costs less than $50,000. So that's kind of an extra bonus point there if you go ahead and provide us with that additional work because we feel an audit does provide us with the most information that can possibly be provided. Uh, replacement projects get points when they're replacing energy used on their operation. So the more energy you offset, the higher the points. Uh, that is up until 150%. At that time, you've crossed the threshold, you're considered an energy generation project. So energy generation projects are just renewable energy projects. I mean, they're yeah, renewable energy projects selling directly to the grid. Also, please note that replacement projects must show prior energy use in a facility of the same size or within 10% uh, more or less. So uh, a new building proposed to have solar panels installed on the roof to offset energy use would not receive any replacement points because there's no prior energy use. However, an existing building uses 20,000 kilowatts and the proposed renewable energy system will generate 25,000 kilowatt hours annually, then a replacement scoring points would be considered. The environmental benefit letter is a letter from a federal, state, or local uh, organization that references the project, uh, references our program, and the project, the applicant. Uh, I have an example. All right, so the Department of Commerce, uh, as you can see, this letter, um, it's blacked out, but the project name is on there. The Our project our program name is on there as well as the goals of the state that the project is, is meeting. So this is an excellent letter and would get 10 points for this, for this scoring uh, category. Uh, commercial availability and warranty. I did discuss commercial availability a little bit ago, so I won't go into that. Again, submitting uh, that information to us under tab D is sufficient. Uh, again, that's um, something that we can do with vendor brochures or, or the like. Um, also note that warranty points are only available uh, to the commercially available projects. Um, from them we'll need uh, a statement from a contractor or supplier as well as evidence of the purchase if need be. Uh, the technical review is a 35-point uh, category, which is quite uh, extensive when you're looking at 135 points. So we really need you to work on the narrative and provide the most complete story that we can. Uh, usually they tend to be around um, 8 to 10 pages and really discuss the entire project uh, from the project team to the resource available as well as dismantling and disposal of the project. So we do look at it from the 
from the first uh, to the end. Uh, readiness is what we need to pro provide uh, to our scoring criteria by looking at the bank statement or an official letter from the bank. So we're looking here at financially ready projects. We also look and give additional points for small egg producers or very small businesses. The threshold for small egg is less than $200,000 or there is points available for if you're between two hundred and six hundred thousand. and 600000 And this again is gross market value of your egg products. Small businesses or very small businesses qualify for these points if they are, have a less than a million dollars in annual sales and less than 15 employees. A simplified application, um, if you are submitting a, an application for $200,000 or less in total project costs, you get these points automatically. If you have not received an award in the past two years, you get points. Um, and then uh, our second to the last category is the simple payback criteria. And this is really looking at really what I call just straight uh, return on investment with no other factors included. So we're looking at the total project cost divided by income or savings, depending if you're an energy efficiency project or a renewable energy project. Uh, the renewable energy generation projects um, are looking at the same criteria, but they do need to factor in maintenance, depreciation, and interest. These tend to be a little bit larger projects, so they have a little bit more expenses that we need to consider when we're looking at simple payback. Uh, the final criteria is state director or administrator points. Um, if there's money from the state, the state director has some discretion in giving points. Uh, Minnesota in the past has given points to renewable energy projects uh, as well as energy efficiency projects that uh, are part of like a, a main street business. So let's say like a grocery store uh, that wants to do some energy efficiency, lighting and refrigeration would receive points. Um, the administrator points is from the national office. In the last couple of years, they've been giving points to renewable energy projects, but again, that's up to their discretion. So I just want to say good luck in the 2014 application cycle if you are going to submit an application. If you have any questions, uh, there's my contact information on the left. On the right-hand side is the state map of the five, um, what we call specialists, that work uh, with the REAP program. Uh, as you can see, um, they're distributed throughout the state. We have Alexandria, Baxter, Cambridge, Austin, and Worthington. And so this kind of split up um, five, different, five different ways. And so they actually are going to be doing the processing and are just as, if not more, uh, experts in this program as I am. So I'm going to turn it over to Fritz right now. Thanks, Ron. Uh, hi, everyone, and thanks for taking an hour out of your day to listen to our, uh, our REAP webinar. Uh, my name is Fritz Ebinger. I'm the Energy Program Manager at the Minnesota Project and also a CERTS partner. Uh, the Minnesota Project has been around for 35 years and has been partnered with CERTS since uh, its inception in 2003. Uh, briefly about CERTS, CERTS is a Minnesota statewide partnership organization with a shared mission to connect individuals and their communities to the resources they need to identify and implement clean energy projects, including energy efficiency and renewable energy. We work with communities and individuals to adopt energy conservation, energy efficiency, and renewable energy technologies and practices for their businesses, farms, and local institutions. Uh, so how does CERTS work? CERTS is split into seven regions that allows us to tailor our approach to each region's needs. For example, the Southwest has a really great wind resource and the Northeast has excellent biomass resources and so we have a little bit more specialization in those areas. Um, uh, we operate on three different platforms or, or actions. They are learn, connect, and act. And the public are more than welcome to learn on our blog and our website. There are many case studies. Uh, we connect frequently at different events, local groups, and conferences. Uh, just a, about 10 days ago, we had a great solar conference about state policy and financing mechanisms. And ACT, we actually do projects, and then we report on them. We report the numbers uh, to the public so they know um, the success of the projects and how much energy they're saving or they're producing. 
Uh, I'm going to roll right into some project examples for REAP um, just to help listeners envision projects that they might be thinking of and uh, maybe provide a little bit of a template. The first one to start with is Angle Hardware. It's in the heart of Lester Prairie, Minnesota, a, a town in West Central of about 1,700 people. Uh, Angle Hard Hardware coins itself a hardware store and so much more. And it has a gift shop inside and also has this beautiful solar array on its roof. It's uh, 48 panels that were installed in 2010, consisting of 10.28 kilowatts. Uh, it has an annual energy generation of 14,000 kilowatt hours a year, which is the, the building's entire energy need. Uh, the total project cost was $80,000, and the cost to the owner was $11,000 after a REAP grant, Excel Solar Rewards rebates, and uh, some other tax benefits. Uh, next project is was actually not a REAP project, but it's a good candidate for REAP. This is Langmoe Brothers Farms. They had three turkey barns that they upgraded with LED lights. Uh, Langmo Brothers is located in Darwin, Minnesota, just, just outside of Litchfield, Minnesota. Uh, they had an energy efficiency approach. Um, the lights they installed were 12 watt LED lighting from a company known as Once Innovations that's based in Plymouth. And the bulbs have a, a unique sunrise and sunset feature to encourage birds to eat more. Um, we found in a related study that most turkey producers have their lights on for about 12, anywhere from 12 to 24 hours a day, which, which can incur a significant cost if they have incandescent or high-pressure sodium fixtures. Um, and uh, the annual energy savings by installing the LEDs was $3,947. The total project cost was $7,450, and the cost to the owner was uh, $1,925 after a utility rebate program and uh, a, some money from a grant program. Uh, next I'm going to talk about a laundry room which is based up in Ely, Minnesota. They had a, a renewable energy approach uh, using solar thermal panels. Uh, it's a 2007 laundromat revamp. Uh, those solar panels are solar skies panels made in Alexandria, Minnesota. Um, I guess under today's policy in 2014, those will qualify as made in Minnesota solar thermal panels uh, that would qualify for a state-funded rebate. The project is five, four by 10 foot solar hot water collectors with a 240 gallon hot water storage system. Uh, the annual energy generation is about two thirds of the water heating cost in summer and half the water heating cost in winter. And the total project cost was $20,000, 860 bucks. Uh, this was not a good candidate for REAP, but um, I will say that when the project owner installed the solar thermal panels, many people laughed at her because the cost of LP heat was so low. And I think she is having the last laugh this winter. Um, next we have the Reese Family Dairy Farm. It's a dairy farm located down in Goodhue County, Minnesota, just a little bit southeast of the Twin Cities. Uh, this also has uh, Made in Minnesota qualified uh, Solar Skies panels are four, four foot by eight foot uh, hot water collectors. Um, after an energy assessment, the project owner learned that 41% of the dairy's energy budget was used for, for heating, uh, heating and hot water needs. And these panels supply the equivalent of 4,700 kilowatt hours of electric heat. Uh, the total project cost was $14,000. And the cost to the owner was uh, $9,000 after a search to seed grant. Uh, this also would have been a candidate for REAP. Here we have another, another uh, REAP-funded project. This is Colonial Cleaners down in the southwest corner in Wardenton. Um, it's a laundromat and dry cleaning business, and they had an energy efficiency approach. They had uh, installed 10 high-efficiency Electrolux dryers, Electrolux dryers and the annual energy savings were pretty significant and they cut the gas bills in half. The total project cost was $54,000 and the REAP grant award was $10,510. Next we have uh, another kind of project concept for REAP. This is Paradox Farm. This is the Garden Goddess project, which is a passive solar technology with underground heat storage um, project. It's a greenhouse business 
located in Ashby, Minnesota, using renewable energy, again, passive solar. We had an annual energy savings of 769 gallons of propane, which is a lot of propane. Uh, the total project cost was $15,500, and the cost to the owner was $12,500 after a CERT seed grant. Um, a great way to extend the growing season in cold Minnesota. Here we have the Gibbs Dairy Farm. As you can see, it's a really nice solar array on the roof. Uh, located in Altura, Minnesota, obviously a renewable energy approach. The technology consists of 166 photovoltaic panels for a total watt system of 39,840 watts. Um, for those who know about net metering, Minnesota has a 40 kilowatt net metering cap, so the facility, at least for rural electric cooperatives and municipalities, has to be under uh, 40 kilowatts in order to use the net metering setup. The annual, gener annual energy generation of this array is approximately 30% of the farmer's electricity, which kind of gives you a ballpark idea that dairy farms do use a lot of energy. Uh, the total project cost was $184,000. The cost to the owner was less than $40,000 after Excel Solar Rewards rebates federal and federal tax credits. And this would have been a great candidate for REAP. Uh, last, lastly, we just have a, a concept. This is actually a, a template after a, a public project, which does not qualify for re because it's a public entity. But uh, this would have been great for us. This is a, a biomass project, 6,000 square foot business. Uh, it was in Renville County, Minnesota. Specifically, it was the city of Franklin. They did a nice biomass project uh, consisting of a technology of 250,000 BTU biomass boiler heating system. Uh, the annual energy savings was... 100%. Um, it was all biomass heated. Uh, they offset their entire energy consumption with whatever the, the prior heating entity or prior, prior heating technology was. Um, and so the energy savings annually came out to $4,867. The total project cost was $64,200. Again, this was a City of Franklin project. Um, just a, a great project concept that might apply to a different small business. I also mentioned that in Minnesota, uh, they just rolled out a grant program called SWEAT, Statewide Wood Energy Team, um, that uh, interested parties might want to take a look at in terms of uh, other sources of funding. And that's that rounds out the, the project concepts. Again, uh, this is Fritz Ebinger. I'm a CERT partner. Uh, again, we're all about Minnesotans building a clean energy for the future. If you want to learn more or just get some more project ideas out there, you can visit us on the web at www.cleanenergyresourceteams.org. And now I'm going to pass the mic back to Ron and our associate Alexis for some questions and answers. All right. Yeah, we got a lot of questions in through the chat uh, window during the webinar, so we have plenty of time to go through them. I'll just kind of go through them, Ron, and you can answer them. Sure. Um, so the first one is, are tribes or tribal governments eligible to apply for REAP grants and loans? Uh, no, tribal entities would not be an eligible REAP applicant, uh, with the exception of a tribal utility. Um, there is a stipulation in the rule that those those would be allowed. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, how about, can a small business or farm apply for a REAP grant, say for LED lighting, an energy efficiency project, and a separate REAP grant for solar PV or another kind of renewable energy project at the same time? Yeah, that's a good question. You can actually apply for uh, a renewable energy project and an energy efficiency project in one, one year, but they would be considered separate applications. So, um, so the answer is yes, but one, the, the, for example, the solar project should be submitted separately and the energy efficiency project would be submitted separately and they will be both scored and funded as as funds allow. And as separate projects. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, as separate projects. All right. And then is there anything on project eligibility around approved technologies? You know, are there any approved technologies that can be funded or technologies that can't be funded? Or is there no hard and fast line like that? Yeah, no, all projects, uh, technologies, you know, renewable energy, um, can, on the renewable energy side, it can be can be funded all the way to actually hydrogen, which is is still pretty pretty new, um, but we can we can do that. 
Um, and on the energy efficiency side, we can do anything that saves energy. So we're, we're wide open there as well. I was just noting some projects that we primarily do in the state, but um, it's, it is a lot more diverse than that even. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then can you go back and uh, rediscuss how um, to determine a small rural business like that? What is actually qualifying the business as small again? Yeah, so the small business clarification is done through uh, the Small Business Administration. We have basically adopted what their standards are. And on their website, there's a size standard table. So, for example, um, if you're a grain farmer, it's based on annual sales. So you would be considered a small business if you had $750,000 or less sales. Now, if you are an energy producer, like there's a classification for energy production, that's actually quite a bit more sizable in terms of, I think it might be like, 300 employees or something like that it's it is uh, it's one or the other it's either going to be employees or uh, the size of the income okay or sales okay and then for this year 2014 is there a new project cost tier system or is it the same as previous years with one application for projects under two hundred thousand dollars and a different application for projects mm -hmm. above two hundred thousand? yeah that's an that's another good point we didn't discuss the the future of the of the program and what the farm bill holds uh, that was passed this year, but there is a stipulation in there that does allow for a third tier under uh, eighty thousand dollars in total project cost. So, but for the two thousand fourteen cycle, we're just going to be doing under two hundred thousand and over two hundred thousand for the grant amount. So next year we'll be incorporating those new changes into our rule. There was just not enough time this year to to include that. Um, we have an upcoming rule change and there will be a number of changes in there, including this tiered three-tiered application and some scoring criteria changes as well. So stay tuned. Great. Um, the forms that you showed today, were those just for Minnesota or can those be used in other states? Um, they are just specific to, to Minnesota, but there are very um, few references other than the first pages that reference my name and website um, so there's other um, so if you're from another state go ahead and you can use that I would contact that state's coordinator to see if that's okay or if they have another template themselves that they would like to see being used and if you get to our national office website there is a list of energy coordinators for every state uh, on there okay. I think again if you just go to the rural development or USDA Rural Development REAP, and don't put in Minnesota, just leave it that way. I think you'll get to the National Office website, and then you'll be able to find a list of coordinators. Okay. Good. Are there any rules against, say, a solar installer completing the application, the grant application for a client? Yeah, there are no um, stipulations for who can provide the application. I mean, the applicant needs to be the owner. There, a third party can fill out that application. It can be an installer, it can be a dedicated grant writer, um, a, a number of people. So, okay. And those grant writers, um, are those provided on the website as well? There is, yeah, there are a list of grant writers that have either worked in the state or have asked to be placed on that list that can provide any sort of assistance to you on that okay. writing. Great. Um, uh, let's say we apply and we can't, we don't get the funding this year. How many years would our application stay in the pool to be considered for funding? Generally, there's two. It can be considered for two years. So, for example, if you submitted this year and uh, didn't weren't selected, you can apply in 2015. Just basically saying, I want to uh, re reapply. Or basically, we call them rollovers. Mm -hmm. They roll over to the next the next year. So basically, two years. Um, mm -hmm. That's as if you haven't if you haven't started. If um, I mean, if you have if you have started, I would can do that for two years. If you have not started, I would consider resubmitting a new application that maybe you could improve your score. Okay. You know, maybe rework the technical report or ask us where you might be able to uh, get a little bit more 
you know, points, five points, ten points can make or break the, the project some years. Okay. Does the applicant need to do anything at the state office to get their application looked at during the rollover year, the second year? Uh, no. It no, it, it'll, yeah, it automatically rolls over with your same score and all you're doing is, is competing, you know, again. So, you know, there might be another, say, 100 or 150 projects that come in. You know, that year you'll be competing against new projects, you'll be competing against as well as the old projects. But um, if there's, you know, additional funds, if Congress has discretionary funding that, like last year, where we had more funds than we thought we were going to have, we did a, quite a few rollovers. Okay. Okay. Can you discuss matching funds? Are they required and are they scored positively? Yeah, they are. Um, we don't consider them to be necessarily re requi required. But as part of the scoring system, they're worth 15 points. And so um, we really encourage those to be uh, included in the project. Um, it's a relatively easy category to get and something that you should be able to hopefully secure as part of the your funding package. And really does allow us to say that the project is ready to go. Mm -hmm. and, so that uh, falls under that readiness. Readiness criteria. Okay. Yeah. Great. Um, do projects financed under the loan guarantee program or the grant program require paying prevailing wage to contractors? Uh, no, we don't. Yeah, we don't require the, that uh, that criteria. I know the prevailing wage or state wage rates or if Davis Bacon gets uh, asked of us if we require that, we do not. So. Okay. All right. Um, this next few questions are about the energy assessment or the energy audit. First, can you discuss the difference between those two, an energy assessment and an energy audit? Mm -hmm. So an energy assessment is required uh, or can be submitted on projects less than $50,000 in total project cost. Um, it's done by a, either a certified energy manager, a professional engineer, or a... Um, Approved energy or uh, an energy assessor, so someone with knowledge of of energy uh, issues. Uh, it's a lot less detailed. Um, something like a lighting project is a good fit for this one, uh, or the energy assess assessment, because it's not quite as substantial information is needed. It's pretty easy to figure out the wattage of the lights you're using, and then the wattage you're you're going to be replacing. So. Um, Again, a lot less detail. An energy audit is required for projects over fifty thousand dollars, and do require a certified energy manager or a professional engineer to submit. Again, on the opposite of that, not the opposite of that, but on a, on a different scale, uh, a lot more information needs to be submitted to be considered an energy energy audit. Okay. So that's the short of it. I mean, I have a direct definition that if anybody wants further clarification or yeah. Wants to ask, then so let me know. Have, you might have just answered the second question, which are there any extra points awarded um, to an applicant if you have the certified, a certified professional perform the energy study? It sounds like some sort of certification is required for the assessment or the audit. Yeah, you don't get any extra points if your project's over fifty thousand dollars, but you may get, like I said, five additional points if you're if you give us an audit. And your project was under fifty thousand okay. dollars. Um, if you're looking at a renewable energy project, again, this isn't uh, maybe considered an energy study as well, but in our energy site assessment, you don't get any extra points. But we we definitely are going to look at the technical report in the more favorable light when we see that a detailed energy assessment's been done, okay. and not just looking at um, kind of an overview map or um, like on a solar project using you know, PV watts is, is a good tool, but if you are, again, looking at the site and making sure there's no blockage of any sort of, or shading, I think I believe it's called, and using the solar path on your, you know, sort of site assessment that mm -hmm. some, a qualified site assessor would do, um, again, additional, not additional points, but... Looked favorable. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, the point, it would definitely be scored higher. The technical work would be scored higher than one that didn't use that. Okay. And then the costs for having, let's say, a third party do the site assessment or the audit, energy audit, can those costs be included in the total project costs being requested in the grant? Yes, you, you, can, yeah, you can include those as, as project 
costs. So that is an ineligible expense um, in any sort of engineering that's all considered eligible. eligible. An ineligible where the grant writer costs? Grant writer costs, yeah. It's, it's the primary one that we see that, that wouldn't be eligible. Like I said, even switching over from propane to natural gas is, is eligible as, as part of the overall project. Um, so we can roll in a lot of those costs. Okay. All right. Um, and then this gets more into the side of, you know, once the grant money is awarded, let's say, um, is a grant for small solar jobs, you know, under $200,000 paid before the job is completed or would the client or contractor have to wait some period of time until, you know, after the job is finished to get the grant funds? I guess more so like how long after submitting the application yeah. are people notified of being awarded? Yeah, it depends on the, the project um, size. We do award some projects at the end of June for under twenty thousand dollars. So if your project costs are under eighty thousand, total project costs are around eighty thousand dollars or less, we do tend to award those at the end of, of June. Um, so you could begin the summer. Uh, the remainder of the funds um, will be some, will be uh, awarded at the end of the fiscal year. For us, is September thirtieth. So um, anytime at that time you uh, will know about it you know once we once you're awarded the funds uh, essentially we could have it wrapped up within a month really of, of financing there's really no uh, minimum time so once we have all the contracts written up and signed and we have proof that the project was done and we've inspected it we will we will get the funds out to the applicant as soon as possible so okay and the last one is uh, the grant Money received is that income taxable? Is it taxable income? I believe it is taxable income. Um, I would discuss that with your accountant, but from what I've heard, it is uh, taxable. All right, that's it for the Q and A. All right, thank you. Um, so thanks again for attending the REAP webinar um, that we put on by USDA Minnesota and CERTS, the Great Plains Institute. Um, Appreciate any questions that you have. You can direct them to me at Ron Oman, uh, my phone number and email address are on the last slide here that we have up. So again, uh, let us know if you have any questions. Thanks and have a good day.